awesome. Let me fix this thing too. All right. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. It's week nine. This is the last week of lectures for this class since we meet Monday, Friday. That means that next week, uh, Memorial Day, Monday, means that this Friday is our last lecture. Uh, also, this week, so a couple just general announcements. This is the last lab, uh, is this week. Um, and then we're kind of into the final stretch of assignments here now with assignment six ha having its deadline was last Saturday. Um, you still have until tonight at midnight if you are working up until the hard deadline. And we just released assignment seven, uh, the heap allocator assignment. That's coming in on Wednesday. And if you would like to kind of stretch that out, we're giving you out until Saturday. But do be aware that Friday and Saturday are part of final exams. So hope, you know, I think the, um, and especially given that we will absolutely not take any submissions past Saturday night, um, please make sure you get, you know, please make sure you make some submits early. You can submit multiple times. Just make sure you get something, um, something to us and don't cut it too close. And especially if you have an exam on the Friday or the Saturday, we highly recommend that you, you uh, make the, the deadline on Wednesday so that no, we don't start running into any of your exam, exam prep. Okay, and a reminder that our final is on the last day of finals week. That's going to be the Wednesday, uh, June 8th. Um, so keep that all in mind as we get into things. All right, so for today, we're going to, last time we talked about a little bit about optimization. We saw a few different um, techniques that the compiler could use and some techniques that we could use to optimize our code. Today we're going to sort of take a different approach to optimization. We're going to talk about um, ultimately this thing called the memory hierarchy. Um, and we're going to see some more examples of how to measure the performance of our code, uh, some more examples of things that we can do to make our code run more efficiently to run faster. But um, before I define the memory hierarchy and before I motivate sort of why this is even a thing and that, we've, that we need to discuss at all, I want to just start right up with a, with a code example to kind of help us get, set the scene uh, for, our, for our discussion. Okay? So here uh, I've got my my, fun my code here, and I have inside of this array.c file, I'm showing a variety of different ways that we could sum up an array. So here you can see yeah, this, this version is just going to, the normal, pretty straightforward code. We've got, we're going to go from 0 up to n and sum up the elements of this array. We have a version that will go backwards, so starting up at n minus 1 and then coming back down. Uh, we've got a couple other variants. I'll, uh, I'll actually I'll talk about the unrolling one in a moment. Um, we've got a version that it looks a little odd, but you know, go with me on this, uh, where we're summing up all of the even elements before we sum up all the odd elements, right? So you can see that this this loop starts at i equals one. This one starts at i equals zero. And then lastly, we have a version that sums up the array in a random order. So here you can think of indexes as a random permutation of the numbers from 1 to n. So this will add up every element of the array, assuming indexes is correctly set up, but it will add them up in a random order. Okay? And what I want to know is, when I run these five variants, what, what, are the performance, what does the performance look like? Uh, how well will these variants do? We see the code. The code's basically the same, um, just in you know running the loop in different directions and with a you know. But they're all ultimately going to look at every element of the array, so maybe we'd expect there shouldn't be that much of a difference. And so we can kind of see what's happening here. So we see that forward and backwards, they kind of look roughly the same. We might explain the differences between these in terms of just a little bit of variance. So I'm using the same kind of cycle counting um, metrics that we talked about on Friday. So we're counting 
um, we're actually asking the processor how many sort of how many cycles it took to execute execute our code, right? Uh, so this is basically proportional to uh, the amount of time it took um, for our particular processor, but it'll factor out things like it'll it'll try to factor out things like other users um, and stuff like that. Okay, we can see that this this unrolled version um, was a little bit faster, so I kind of want to know what's going on there. That's interest. That seems interesting. Uh, and then we see that the so the even an odd one. Okay, that's a little bit slower. Uh, you know, maybe we can try to find a way to explain that. And then, but this random one is the one that's really kind of dragging us down here. That one's coming up six times slower than just adding up the elements from in forward order. But hey, I mean, come on, we're just we're adding up the same elements, so what's what's the problem? Well, we can ask, just like from last time, we could ask call grind. So I'll come over here, I'll, I'll close the code because call grind will show us the code anyway. And so I'm gonna run val grind, tool is call grind on dot slash array. And so then I'm gonna, so I made a little script to handle our annotations. So it's I'm basically running call grind annotate just like I did before, but this is just gonna make things easier in case I forget uh, to type something. And so we can see, first of all, um, we can see that the number of instructions is pretty similar throughout here, right? And it doesn't really, so let me just go right into the code and just so just show you each of these variants here. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna come down. So for the sum forward and the sum backwards, you can see that the numbers are basically the same. Uh, the number of instructions for the for loop. So it looks like this iteration, the, the for loop code itself took up uh, three instructions per iteration. And it looks like the sum plus equals a bracket i took up uh, two instructions per iteration um, since we have a million element array. Right, and then we've got the backwards one. The code looks the same. Um, the unrolled one is kind of interesting. So the idea behind this version of the code, what we're trying to do with uh, loop unrolling, so this kind of is related to our discussion of just code optimizations from last time, here's another way that we could try to optimize our code, which is that if we don't want to spend three million instructions running through this for loop, we could imagine instead having our for loop um, sum up our elements in groups of four. So here I've got, the, I've got this, this loop running um, at multiples of of four, so I'm going, so I'm actually running down, but um, so I minus equals four, which means that in total, I'm only running a fourth as many instructions for the loop uh, control itself, for just the for loop itself. I'm doing the same number of instructions to actually sum up the array though, because now I have to add up all four uh, elements in this, in this group. Right, and so the benefit of loop unrolling here is that I'm actually running half as many instructions, right? A total of 2.75 million uh, instructions here, as opposed to, oops, shouldn't have dragged. Whoa, what happened? All right, let's try that again. <laughs> Apparently dragging is not happy about this. I did not expect that. Good to know. So um, we've got, 2.75 million instructions, but it's not like it ran that much faster. It did not run twice as fast, right? Coming over here, we can see that the, it ran a little bit faster, but really not that much in comparison to something forwards and something backwards. So this could help with a certain amount of overhead, but it's obviously not totally solving our problem. If I come down to the even and odd one, recall this took one and a half times what something forward and something backwards did. All right, so three, roughly three million versus 4.5 million. But the number of instructions, if I add them all up, is the same. 1.5 million plus 1.5 million is three million. Million plus a million is two million. So we're still gonna get our three and our two. And whatever the heck is going on to explain you know, I can come, to, can come down to random. There's one million extra instructions here because we have to look up the, the indexes array. But 
This is still 6 million versus 5 million uh, instructions for the other one. That is, that is not explaining the six time slowdown. Right? So whatever is going on here uh, for our program to be running this much slower, these numbers aren't going to do it. Right? These numbers aren't telling us what the problem is. And the reason for that is that we now have to undo a pretty substantial assumption that we've been making all quarter. So far, we've so far, we've been assuming that every access to memory, so every time we say array bracket i, we assume that that took the same amount of time. Right? Accessing array bracket 0, accessing array bracket n, we assume that every iteration took the same amount of time. And now we're going to find out that that's actually just false. So I'm going to come to the slides for, uh, the, for most of our our discussion today, but I will come back to this once we have a good understanding of how the memory actually works. I'm going to come back to these examples and I'm going to review them again to just try to understand what happened. So let me introduce this idea now of what the memory hierarchy is and why this is and why our assumption is actually false. So at this point, we've talked about RAM, right? And we think about, and so we've talked about, so I'm going to use memory and RAM interchangeably uh, pretty much today. And we can think about as we try to set up, or as we try to kind of create one of these systems, that we, we have three main goals. One of the goals is that we want the, the memory to be high capacity. So we could imagine having something like, uh, four or eight gigs of RAM. And you know, that's, there's a lot of space there. So we, we want to be able to store you know, some, some multiple gigabytes of, of memory. But we also want it to be really fast to access. Ideally, we would like to be able to say, you know, moving something from RAM, we would ideally like that to take one cycle. Right? We'd like, that, we'd like a memory access to be as fast as adding two registers together or something like that. And um, a third kind of ideal goal would be that we also kind of want it to be cheap, like monetarily, right? We don't want to say, oh, hey, I can give you this really awesome piece of RAM uh, that has, you know, that has, is like this huge capacity and is also really fast, but it's going to cost you a billion dollars. That's not really going to work for us. Well, it turns out that we're kind of stuck. We can't actually have all three of these goals um, in, in one piece of memory. And so to give you a couple of examples of, so the pieces that we've talked about so far with our processor have actually been on two different sides of the spectrum, or two ends of the spectrum uh, on this. Mostly we'll be comparing uh, capacity with speed. Um, we're kind of holding the price fixed because if the computer costs a million dollars, you wouldn't buy it. So um, we're basically assuming the price is kind of you know, within a normal computer budget, and we're just going to call it, um, call that kind of constant. But so let's compare for a moment registers with memory, All right? So with RAM, the registers on one end were really, really small. We only had 16 of them, and each one's only eight bytes. But as a result, they're really fast. How fast are they? Well, I could say I have, I could have an instruction like add. RAX to RDX, and we can think about whenever we talk about a cycle, we can think of one cycle as being one of those add instructions, right? Adding two registers together. So if you think of add RAX RDX, we can access those two registers uh, just you know, very quickly in one cycle. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got memory, we've got RAM. And this is rather large, right? We're talking about a few gigabytes here. But it, as a result, it's actually going to be really slow. So the truth is, these memory accesses that we kept thinking of as just one instruction, oh, that's not a big deal. You're going to read it from memory. If we actually had to read them from RAM, they would be pretty slow. Right? 
There's actually another problem uh, that, you know, so we're not a hardware class, but it's, we're kind of getting into that space of talking a little bit about hardware issues. So I'll mention this problem as kind of just something that as systems programmers, we, we do want to know, which is that the performance of our processors has consistently been increasing very quickly. So you think about, uh, so you may have heard something like more about uh, Moore's Law. And the idea behind Moore's Law was that every 18 months or so, we could put double the number of transistors. So this is the actual definition, is that every, every um, 18 months, we can put double the uh, number of transistors on, onto a chip. What that, actually what that has consistently been translating to over the past 40 or 50 years has been that every 18 months, we can kind of feel like our computers are getting twice as fast. Um, there have been various hurdles throughout that. So uh, up until maybe the 90s, the way we were increasing performance was we just made our computers run faster. We increased the number of, you know, we increased the frequency. We, we went from a one gigahertz to a two gigahertz to three gigahertz processors. Now we are, we're now in the space where we're doing a lot of multi-core stuff. So it's not that I give you a six gigahertz processor, it's that I give you two three gigahertz processors and we pretend like that's twice as fast even though it's kind of not. But, you know, it, it's still a really impressive uh, performance gain. So we're still seeing really great um, performance gains, you know, easily exponential time, exponential gains, uh, year after year after year. Now, memory, so the performance of RAM is also uh, kind of exponential. We're, I think we've seen, a, I think it's roughly like 5% per year or so um, in terms of just improvements to RAM. And um, you know, one of our, our EE professors here um, who teaches EE 180 will op would often say, well, for any other field than CS and EE, saying that you could get a 5% per year improvement on your technology is actually really good. Right? So if we think about something like, I don't know, you know structural engineering or, or like mechanical or something, like being able to say, oh yeah, my material is just like 10% faster than it was like a year ago. That's like, whoa, really? That's pretty stellar, right? There's, um, that's not something that a lot of other fields can really count on. But in comparison to the performance of our processors, um, this is kind of not gonna work. Memory is falling behind. So the gap, between the registers and the memory, the gap between what is fast like processor fast and slow like memory slow is gradually increasing as our processors get faster and our RAM is unable to keep up. So what do we do? Well, it turns out there's this, we take, we, the solution is what we call caching. What we're gonna do is we're gonna is we're going to, and this kind of seems a little weird, we're gonna make a compromise. And we're gonna say, all right, well in addition to the registers and the RAM, we're gonna give you this other location, which is going to be kind of fast, but also pretty small. Now on one hand, you might hear that and say, well, gosh, that doesn't sound like it's actually solving our problem. Right? We wanted something really fast and really large, and I say, well, guess what? You can't have either of them. Here, have something that's kind of slow and kind of small, and like, you're gonna actually be able to solve, we're gonna solve our problem that way. But somehow this is actually gonna help. Um, and, and so our goal for today is to explore how exactly, that, how exactly this, this helps. One note about the idea of caching is that caches are managed entirely by the hardware. So the reason we haven't had to learn about them so far is that they're not exposed to us in the assembly language. So remember the ISA was the contract between software and hardware? The ISA doesn't say anything about caching. It just says, yes, there's this big block of memory, you go ahead and go access the memory. And the hardware will take care of, uh, of all this caching stuff for us. So we won't actually see it in the assembly instructions, but we will feel it in our program's performance. To better understand exactly how caching works, let me give you an analogy um, to something that, you know, is sort of maybe is a little bit more kind of real world for you. So imagine if you were in the situation where uh, you were writing 
an essay. And so you are writing um, an essay for some class and being a, you know, writing a good kind of proper argument, you need to refer to various sources uh, as part of your research. Now, this analogy is, may, may become slowly outdated as uh, the prevalence of online materials kind of increases, but bear with me. Assume that you actually do need to go and get some books from the library or something, okay? And so we can kind of think of, so here's kind of how the analogy starts out. In the sort of small and fast space, we have what's on your desk. So on your desk is maybe, you know, the, the paper that you're working on, whether that be on your laptop or just actually writing some stuff down, and maybe like a book that you're working with at the moment. And accessing stuff on your desk is pretty fast. You can just kind of reach over and grab it. Now, we might ask, well, hey, if our desk, you know, and this question kind of came up when we talked about registers. Well, hey, if registers are super fast and they're really nice, why don't we just have thousands of registers? Well, you can imagine what would happen if I just made your desk like, hey, well, can I just give you like a 100 foot long desk? Would that help? Well, not really, because once, uh, you know, papers and books start, you know, uh, aren't in arm's reach anymore, the benefits of having a really long desk aren't really going to help, aren't really helping it, uh, are, are being pretty, are, are diminishing quite heavily. So, okay, we can't keep everything we want on our desk, so what do we do? Well, there's Green Library. Green Library is nice. It's huge. It's got plenty of storage. Uh, it's got every book we could possibly want, right? So imagine the situation where we, you know, all right, so we're, we're writing our essay and we realize, okay, I need a book from the library. So I hop on my bike and bike down to Green Library. And as of now, the way we were presenting memory access, the way we were thinking about accesses is we, we, we thought of it like this. We'd bike to Green Library. We will find the book on the shelf, we open it to the page that we need, we copy down the passage that we want, and then we leave the, leave the book there and bike back. And then, you know, maybe an hour from now, we realize, oh shoot, I need another passage from the same book. I'm gonna hop on my bike, go back to Green Library, find the same book again, look up the passage, copy down, bike back. Oh, I need another passage, bike over, look up another book. This is pretty inefficient, right? This sounds pretty silly. Why would I want to, like, having to bike down to green every time I need to look up a sentence from this book seems like a huge waste of time. So let's introduce the concept of a bookshelf. So the bookshelf in our room is a compromise between, it's not quite, between speed, it's not quite in arm's reach, but it's still pretty close to us. We can just kind of walk over and grab a book. Uh, and it's not quite as large as Green Library, but hey, I can still put a few, a few books there. So what I'll do now is instead, uh, when I find out that I need a book from Green, I'll bike down to Green, get, get the book, check it out, you know, uh, get the passage that I need, leave it on my shelf, with the thought that maybe I'm gonna use this thing later. You know, maybe somewhere else in my essay I wanna cite something else from that book. Um, and so then, and overall, like the amount of biking time is decreasing pretty substantially, right? And as it turns out, we actually realized that we can keep extending this. So the truth is, Green Library is itself like a cache because Stanford has way more books than Fit and Green. So what we actually have is we have this auxiliary library out in Livermore, and what happens is every day, there's a truck that drives back and forth between Livermore and Green that just drops off books back and forth. And so it turns out, if there's a book that's not at Green, we actually could just say, hey, I want this book, and uh, the library will say, oh, well, that's out in Livermore, wait until tomorrow, and then come pick it up. And um, obviously, it would be pretty infeasible for us to just leave everything in Livermore and have to wait a day just to get any book that we want. So we're going to use you know, Green Library is kind of our, our place for just kind of the more frequently used, like the books that are probably more relevant to people. And then if you actually need something that's kind of older or a little bit more obscure or something, then we can go and get it from, from there. Cool? So 
maybe this kind of gives you a sense for, you know, why does this even work? Right? Why should we even think that this strategy works? Let me give you a, a, a situation when writing an essay where this wouldn't work. And I sure hope this isn't how you write essays. Right? Imagine if the way you wrote your essay went like this. When you needed a quote, what you do is you bike down to Green Library. You pick a random shelf in the entire library. On that shelf, you pick a random book. You open the book to a random page, and you just copy down a sentence. If that were our model for accessing books, right, completely uniformly random, well, first of all, we'd have the problem that your essay would suck. Um, that's, that's an issue I'm not going to help you solve. But there's another problem, the problem that we are interested in, which is that our bookshelf wouldn't help us in that situation. Right? If every time we wanted to look something up in a book, it was in a completely random book, then what good is keeping the books on our bookshelf? We're never going to find anything that way. So the reason that caches work, so going back to the kind of memory situation now, um, the reason that caches work is because of a key assumption that we are making. We're assuming that memory accesses are not random. We're not just pulling a completely random place in memory every single time we try to access something. This idea is called locality of reference. Locality of reference basically says that we can kind of predict memory accesses in one of two different ways. One version of locality is called temporal locality. And the idea for temporal locality is that if I access a piece of data right now, I'm probably going to access it again very soon. So think about your local variables. Think about when we were summing the array, our sum variable. We kept saying sum plus equals array of i. We're using that sum variable a lot, over and over and over again. That's going to be something we want to keep in our registers. That's going to be something we want to keep very close to us because we are accessing it repeatedly. The other kind of locality that we're counting on is spatial locality. Spatial locality says that if I'm going to access an L of a piece of data, then I'm probably going to access the data that's kind of nearby. And this example kind of goes with array accesses. So we know that arrays are laid out contiguously in memory. So if I access array sub i, array sub i plus 1 will be right next to it. And so one of the most common idioms is going to be to loop over an array from 0 up to n, or maybe backwards. And those are going to be are, are very good for spatial locality. We access array i, then array i plus 1, then i plus 2, i plus 3, and so on, or backwards, i, i minus 1, i minus 2, and so on. Right? So we're counting on this. If we did not have locality of reference, we would, caches would not work. Um, the, the, we, would not have, we would not be able to solve this problem, and we would just be stuck having to go out to memory every single time. But fortunately, these patterns are pretty, pretty common. So far so good? Any issues? So let me give you a few terms. I need to introduce a few terms before I can actually talk sort of concretely about how caches work. Most of the uh, discussion here is going to be pretty high level. Um, I'm going to give you some numbers that are very specific to our machines. But uh, I'm going to try to keep the discussion kind of high level because you know, we're not actually building any caches. If you're interested in the hardware that goes on behind the scenes, there is a class EE180 that will go into all the details about how to make a cache and what the trade-offs are at the hardware level, but we want to think about what caching means for us as programmers, so we're trying to keep the discussion more on the software side. So, but I do need to introduce a few terms. These are the terms that you would run into in EE180, um, but just so that you know, we can actually talk about uh, how we're doing and we'll talk about our performance. Um, the, two, the first two terms, the, kind of the most important two terms, are a hit and a miss. So when we talk about caches. So we think about our cache as being a kind of a, a small little space where we're going to store 
you know, some, some of the most frequently used things, right? Um, a hit means that if we were looking up some piece of data, we found it in the cache. So using the book analogy, right, I realize, oh, I need to use a passage from a book, and I look over on my bookshelf and say, oh, yes, it's on the bookshelf. Perfect. I don't have to bike over to green. No problem. That's a hit. A miss, on the other hand, is I look over on the bookshelf, and I say, it's not there. Shoot, OK, time to go to the library. Or a miss in the library would be I, I, I look in green, I can't find the book, and they say, yeah, sorry, you're going to have to wait until tomorrow. Right. Um, and so what happens when we miss, right? Uh, maybe uh, on, the, on the essay writing front, you might think, well, <laughs> if I can't find the book and it's 3 a.m. and I've got to turn that essay in tomorrow, I'm just going to not put the quote in because that's all I got. Um, you can't do that on our programs, right? With our, with our programs, if I ask to access, a, if, we, if we have an instruction that's trying to access a piece of memory and it's not in the cache, we don't have a choice. We've got to go and get it. We've got to get it from RAM, or maybe, you know, sometimes it might not even be in RAM. It might be uh, on our hard drive or something. We've, we've got to go find that memory somehow. So generally, this means if I'm in a cache that, and, it, and I miss the cache, then I should go to, go to RAM to get it. If it's not in RAM, maybe it's on disk, something like that. OK. A few other terms to introduce to you. Um, the miss rate. Generally, this is, these are in terms of, um, so the miss rate is generally uh, for a particular program. We say that the miss rate for that program, uh, generally expressed as a percentage, is the fraction of accesses that miss the cache. So we want to keep this number down, right? Um, so, so we might say, oh, you know, the program has a 1% miss rate. That means that in 100, every 100 accesses, one of them will miss our cache. And then we've got uh, two timing numbers. We've got the hit time and the miss penalty. You can think of these as, as analogous um, for hits and misses. The hit time is if we hit the cache, if we find something in the cache, how long does it take for us to get it out? Um, because we still have to potentially wait. It's not going to be as fast as it is for a register. And then the miss penalty is if we miss the cache, how long do we have to wait to go out to memory or something to get it? So how much are we penalized for not finding it in our cache? OK, so both of these might be expressed in terms of cycles. Um, in certain situations, we might express them in seconds or something. But anyway. All right. Let me give you a few numbers um, to just help ground our discussion, right? Um, you're not expected to memorize these numbers, but it'll help us put things into perspective a little bit as we, ha as we continue our discussion. Um, and so I'm going to basically give you the capacity of our uh, of of each of these, and then the the hit time. So for the registers, we already know that the registers have uh, there are 16 of them, and each one can hold eight bytes. And we know that we can read and write two registers or so, roughly um, per instruction, right? Maybe three in some cases. Like with an LEA, we can actually read uh, three registers, or we can read and write three registers. Um, so this is very fast. The, you know, so uh, the registers aren't really a cache, so we don't really talk about hit time for them. But you can think of access time to registers being easily less than a cycle. Right? The simplest instructions are all operating on registers. Our myth machines actually have two layers of cache um, that are sort of trying to optimize for different things. We have a smaller cache called the L1, and we have a larger cache called the L2. The L1 cache is uh, 32K. It's 32, yeah, 32 kilobytes. And it generally takes one to two, maybe a little bit, just a little more than that, one to two cycles uh, for a hit time, of, of hit time. So within one to two cycles, we can pull something from this, uh, this cache. And the goal of the L1 is that we really want the hits to be fast. So we're not that worried that the L1 is really small. We're more worried that we can keep uh, the hit time really low. So we'll, we'll take a smaller, a smaller cache if that means that we can service requests very quickly. Remember, our assumption is going to be you know, spatial and temporal locality all the way here. Like if I'm only using 32K of, of data in my entire program, I want that program to run really, really fast. Then there's the L2 cache. So this is 
noticeably larger. It's kind of like three orders of magnitude, or it's like uh, two and a half orders of magnitude larger, right? So it's between four to six megabytes. On some machines, it's four. On some machines, it's six. Um, and what and what this gives us is, so it's a little bit slower. You'll notice it's about an order of magnitude slower. And so you'll generally see as we go down uh, this list that every next level is about an order of magnitude slower than the previous level, but also a couple order, orders of magnitude larger than the previous level. And that's going to be the general pattern, right? Slower, but larger. And, and I could even put disk down here. And disk is well in the terabytes, but is actually like six orders of magnitude slower than, than RAM. Um, so the L2 cache, it's about, uh, it's around here, it's an order of magnitude slower. And our goal with the L2 cache now is we kind of want this thing to be as big as we can make it, um, you know, without, uh, so, so there's also a limit in terms of how expensive we can, um, it is to make these caches. Generally, caches are pretty expensive. So we kind of want these, but the, we kind of want the L2 to be as large as we can make it. Um, because if we miss in the L2, we got to go all the way out to memory, and going out to memory is going to take between 50 and 200 cycles. And that's going to kind of suck. So we want to avoid this level as much as we can. Um, also, I think on the Myth machines, it's actually 8 gigs of RAM. Um, but whatever, 4 gigs, 8 gigs, you will notice. So far, so good. Uh, just a quick nod to modern uh, processors. So our myth machines are actually rather old. They're kind of, I don't know, like 20, 2008, 2009 um, era. Uh, now, with the gap between CPU performance and memory performance increasing more and more, we're actually getting to the point that Intel, as of maybe 2010, I think, decided that they actually needed a level three cache. So they actually inserted something between he right here. Um, that's around 100k or like 200k. Uh, that kind of handles. Um, that's like kind of between the two axes. I don't actually know exactly what the hit times are. And then, very very recently, so like this year, the processors that are some of the high end processors from Intel that are coming out this year actually have an L4 cache, and the L4 cache is between here and here, which is like about 128 megs. It's just like kind of like a little stick of RAM that's sitting on the processor. Um, that's trying to absorb even more of the miss penalty. Because the miss penalty is, again, gradually increasing as the time to access RAM is increasing relative to the performance of our processors. So we're trying to absorb more and more of the miss penalty by throwing more and more levels of cache into it. Okay. So now, why is caching so important, right? So on one hand, you could think of, okay, we, we talked about like, yeah, orders of magnitude, sure, whatever. What is 100 cycles really, right? Do we, do we really care? Um, so here's just a, a little bit of math to help you get a perspective for what, um, what the effect of cache misses really are on our system. So in this scenario, um, imagine if, a hit in our cache uh, were, took one cycle. So um, if we found the data, then it's one cycle to get the data back. But if we don't, then we pay a miss penalty of 100 cycles. So this might be something like, all right, I, I couldn't find it in my cache. I go out to RAM. It's going to take 100 cycles to get the data from RAM. OK? Now imagine if we have a miss rate of 1%. So that means that one in every 100 accesses will miss the cache. 99 out of every 100 will hit. We can compute this number called the average memory access time. And the way we figure this out is we're basically asking, on average, how long is a memory access going to take in cycles? So here's how we calculate that. We say that, well, 99 of our accesses out of 100 hit, um, and those hits took one cycle. Uh, and then one of the uh, accesses missed, and that miss took 100 cycles. So if I add them up and divide by the total number of accesses to get an average, I find out that the average access time was 1.99 cycles per access. Right? 
And my question is, what if we were to increase the miss rate to 3%? So just a 2% increase. How bad is that really? Is it noticeable? Well, let's work through it. Now, 97 of our accesses will hit for one cycle hit time, and three of our accesses will miss. And each incurs a 100 cycle miss penalty. So in total, we end up with an average memory access time of 3.97 cycles. So by increasing our miss rate by 2%, our program ran two times, will basically run two times slower, or our memory accesses will on average be two times slower. And if the, uh, you know, if the number of instructions were the same, then this is going to have an impact of, you know, easily one to two X, right? Slow down of, our, you know, 1.5 to two X slowdown of our program. Yep. How do you know what the miss rate is? Or like ah, good question. The que so the question is, how do I know what the miss rate is? Um, so I told you the hit time and the miss penalty, right? Those are based on, those are based on the hardware. It's like, oh, okay, well, you found it in L1, that's a one to two cycle hit time. If I, if I miss the L1, but I find it in L2, then that miss penalty is like 20 cycles. If I have to go out to RAM, the miss penalty is like 200 cycles. The miss rate's gonna depend on our program. And how do we know what it actually comes down to? Well, we're gonna actually have to measure it. And so we'll see that in a moment that we can actually ask call grind, for example, to tell us, Hey, what is our miss rate? How many of our memory accesses are actually missing? Um, and, and, and when we actually look at the numbers themselves, when we look at which ones are hits and which ones are misses, we can then kind of calculate it ourselves and know what that rate is. But that number is actually is very program dependent. So we can't just say, oh, well, you know, there's not going to be a one size fits all strategy for caching. Um, we're going to need to look at, you know, our particular program to say, you know, is this caching strategy helpful or not? Or we'd look at a collection of programs that we consider to be pretty standard uh, to say, you know, is this new caching design better or worse? You guys? Anything else? So I want to say a little bit about how caches are designed, this is probably the part that I'm going to gloss over the most, but um, I just want to kind of give a nod to how exactly this works in hardware. Remember, none of this is exposed to us as programmers, um, at least in terms of the, like, we can't write our code um, to say, I want this in the cache or not. That's not something that's an option. The processor, the, the hardware is going to take care of all that for us. Um, and so all we can do is write our code to be aware of the fact that there is this thing called caching and it is impacting the performance of our software. So how do caches actually work? Um, we can generally think of a cache, like so a cache is just a big block of memory, right? Like uh, let's say it's a four megabyte block of memory. We can think of it as being divided into a bunch of blocks. Um, and so the idea behind dividing a cache into blocks, so recall back to the idea of locality, one of those was spatial locality. So, with, so if I access array bracket i, I might expect that I want to access, I will want to access array bracket i plus one later, and maybe bracket i plus two and i plus three and i plus four. So when I access array bracket i, the hardware should figure, oh, well, while you're accessing array bracket i, I'm going to go ahead and pull in i plus one, i plus two, i plus three, and so on into my cache in preparation for your program to use them. And the way it's going to do that is it's going to think of the, the cache as being divided into blocks. And whenever we see an access to one byte in that block, we're going to take the whole block in. That make sense? So if I've got a 64 byte block, which is pretty standard on our systems, then that means that if I access one of the four byte integers uh, in our array, we're going to get 15 of its neighbors into our cache as well. Okay? And there's a trade-off, right, between how big should I make this block? You could think, well, maybe I just have my entire cache be, uh, you know, one big block. So you read array sub i, and I just take the whole array, and I just pull it all in. But the problem is that if the, the blocks get too large, um, then I stop being able to store other stuff. What if I'm accessing two different arrays? 
um, then if I have one big block and I pull in everything from one array, and then I have to pull something, everything from another array, then I don't have room in my cache for that anymore. So I'm gonna have to kick out the first thing. Right, so generally we need to kind of compromise between having uh, too large of a block, um, in which case, you know, we won't be able to fit everything that we want in our cache and also, you know, spatial locality only has a limit, right? Like, you're not gonna go to the library and pick up an entire shelf worth of books. Like, that's just not that useful. After a while, you're gonna be like reading three of them and you're like, yeah, I'm done. I don't need anything else. Um, so there is a limit to spatial locality, right? And um, so, right, so we generally set the block size, you know, that's kind of a hardware decision. It's maybe set around 64 bytes, just kind of a, it's pretty standard. And so you might ask, well, okay, then now, how exactly do we find a block in our cache? So let's say we've got, um, let's say my cache has like 100 blocks in it. Um, and so then I wanted, like, I'm searching for an element in that, in the cache, or, or like, I'm looking up this address and I wanna know, is it in my cache or not? Well, you can imagine doing a linear scan of every block and say, is it this one? Nope, is it this one? Nope, 100 times. But remember, we wanna keep hit time down. So we don't wanna do that, that seems pretty slow. We could also, the alternative is we could just say, all right, well, like for a given address, I will just know which block it's gonna belong to. So for every memory address, I will make sure that there is exactly one block in my cache that the address could go into or not. Um, and if it's not in there, then it's definitely not in my cache anywhere else. But then the problem with that is that we can start in getting, a, getting into these kind of conflicts, right? It's like if I read array, you know, A sub I and B sub I, and they happen to map to the same block in my cache, then they'll keep kind of kicking each other out. Yeah? So these are trade-offs that generally the hardware, hardware people make, right? Um, I'll give you just kind of a quick example of what it, of one model that we could use for like how exactly the system could uh, figure out whether of an address that I'm looking at is in the cache. So in this case, I'm imagining that I have a 64 uh, byte cache block and I have 128 entries in my cache. So then, and we're gonna use the simplifying assumption that every address maps to a particular block, right? Now, remember, we're compressing the memory here. So we took our like eight gigabyte RAM or four gigabyte or eight gigabyte RAM and we're stuffing it into this, you know, like 1K or, or I think it comes out to about, about um, yeah, it comes out to 1K here or is that right? No, 8K, well, anyway, whatever, it doesn't matter. It comes out to like just a, a few kilobytes of, of cache. So multiple addresses in RAM are definitely gonna map to the same, uh, same block. Right? So some memory kind of out in the heap is probably gonna map to the same entry in my cache as you know, some memory out in the stack. And so we can imagine uh, a, like using a really simple heuristic, part of our goal is really gonna be that we wanna make sure the hardware can do this mapping really quickly. Right? We said that if we have like a linear scan, that's way too expensive. So we, we need something that's gonna be at least sort of definitely constant time. And so here's a system um, that would work. So here you can think of this as being an entire address, where down here we've got the least significant bits. Um, and you can think of, so the last six bits, because why is it six? Well, because there are 64 byte cache blocks. We can think of the last six bits as mapping, as telling us where in the block our data is. Right, so you could think of, so if I pull in a block, I pull in 64 bytes, and so these Z's will tell us, you know, which byte I actually wanna access. And then the Y's here, so I could use the next most significant bits. This is just an example of, of how we could do something like this. The next seven, say in this case, because there are 128 entries, uh, most significant uh, bits are gonna be telling us which block to look in. So let's say these were all zeros, then that says I should look in entry zero, block zero. If these were all ones, then I should look in entry 127. But how do I actually know if that block has the cache, this data that I want? How do I know that it's, that the data in my cache is actually 
going with this address and not some other address that happens to have the same y bits. Well, then I, all the other bits, so that's what the dot 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 means here, all of the other bits are going to be used as what we call a tag. And so we're going to compare. So in this case, let's say I were to do a, a memory lookup, right? So I, were gonna, I, were, I was going to look up this address, and I want to know if it's in my cache. So first, I use these y bits to look inside my cache at entry you know, y. And I say, OK, like, and now I say, all right, if this address were in the cache, it has to be at that entry. So now how do I know if it is? Well, then all the other bits, so this is like 64 minus however many y and z's there are, 64 minus that, I compare those blue bits um, to like the blue bits that go with the, the entry in my cache, and if they're equal, then I know that that's a hit. And if they're not equal, then I know it's a miss. Does that kind of make sense? So we can just kind of use this as a simple strategy. So basically, we're doing mod. Mod's really easy, right? In hardware, mod by powers of two is really nice. Um, so we can just kind of pull bits off um, to figure out if the, if the entries are, are, are hits or misses. Um, um, yeah. Um, why exactly uh, is the the y part of the address seven bytes, and then the z part is only six? Uh, so the y here would be. So the question is, why is the y seven and the z six? So in this case, I have a sixty-four byte block, cache block. So that means that um, an offset into the block is going to be from zero to sixty-three. So that's why this is uh, six bits. So zero to sixty-three. Does that make sense? And then now I have 128 entries, so that means that the y, the seven y bits are going to be zero to 127 to tell us which block we're looking in. And then the x bits are the same, are, are whatever's left over, for the comparison. Good question. Anything else? So I can tell you that. This isn't exactly what happens on, on processors. What actually happens is there's, there are much more complicated systems that are still fast enough that the hardware can do them, but um, you know, we're not going to talk about them. They're, they'll be covered in EE classes. They're covered in some of the, even the advanced ones will get even more fancy. They're like, oh yeah, you know everything we taught you in the EE class? That was a lie too. Here's what we actually do, and it kind of blows your mind. So you know, uh, that's just kind of a... Part of it, but hopefully this gives you a sense for what that the, at least that the hardware can do this. It can do this pretty quickly, and it can kind of, and because of locality, um, we're feeling pretty good about this helping us out. Okay, so that's all I want to show you from that the slide angle. Let's actually go into the the code and really talk about how we can make use of this, right? So now, all right, fine. There was our. There was our nod to the EE folks that, yeah, yeah, we, we talked about hashing. Don't worry. Um, and now let's actually talk about what it means as programmers. So over here, recall our situation from the beginning of the class. We had this array. Um, we saw this performance that we, uh, forwards and backwards, were taking the same amount of time. And then this random thing was taking a huge amount of time. And we looked at our call grind report and the call grind report didn't tell us anything. It didn't tell us anything useful. It said it, it did not suggest to us that the random should have been six times slower. So let's see if we can get more information from Valgrind. I'm going to run call grind just like before, but I'm also going to add this flag. I'm going to say simulate uh, cache equals yes. Then I'm going to run array. So it's going to take a little bit longer because it has to do more simulation work. That's okay. Incidentally, here we can see. So let me just introduce some terms that Callgrind uses, and then I'll actually explore this number in the annotation. But for one, you'll notice that Callgrind is calculating miss rates for us. So the question, you know, how do we know what the miss rates are? We use a program like Callgrind with the simulate cache, and it'll tell us here's your miss rate. By the way, our miss rate's twenty percent. That's kind of crazy. All right, we need to figure out where that happened. Right? So a 20% miss rate, we already said what the impact of a 3% miss rate is. Um, so missing, missing by 20% seems like a big deal. Um, another quick terminology thing to introduce. So D1 here is talking about the L1 cache. 
uh, for data. So as it turns out, there's a split between, in the L1 cache, there's a separate cache for, because in addition to our array being in memory, we also have our instructions, right? The assembly instructions are in memory too. So there's actually a separate cache for assembly instructions called the I1. Um, and then there's a shared level two cache. Valgrind doesn't call it a level two cache, it calls it a last level cache. But whenever you see LL, basically think two, level two. Whenever you see, um, we won't talk about the I1 cache because it doesn't matter that much. So whenever you see D1, think L L1 cache. Okay? So I'm gonna do an annotation. I'm gonna use my script. Um, and my script, I have this option called minus C that's gonna actually show me the cache information. Uh, we gotta enter the right number here, 19 to whatever. Boop. So first of all, we can talk about this top part a little bit more now, right? So up here, we get some information. So since we asked Valgrind to simulate our caches, Valgrind now actually knows what the cache sizes are. And sure enough, we see a 32K 64 byte entry a level one cache. We see a six megabyte 64 byte entries, uh, 64 byte blocks, uh, last level cache or L2 cache. Okay? And now, in addition to the instruction reads, we also have two other pieces of information. We have DR, which is data reads. So this is accesses to, you could think array bracket I, for example, or any other piece of memory. And then we have D1MR, which stands for level one misses for reads. So, a bigger number in this column means, so every time we miss the L1 cache, this number goes up by one. If we hit the L1 cache, then this number would go up by one anyway. So in either case, this DR is gonna go up by one, right? This is just the total number of reads, but only if we miss is this number gonna go up by one. Let me just show you that. So I'm gonna page down, I'm gonna come back up. So here, we can see our sum, or our sum forward code. We see the same number of instructions that we saw before. That did not change. We still have three million instructions, uh, three million instructions there and two million instructions there. We can see that this second line, the accesses to array bracket I, represents a million data reads. That makes sense. We have an array of a million elements, so we need to read each element of that array, yeah? But we also have 62,501 uh, uh, misses in the cache. Where did this number come from? Well, let's consider. We have a, we have a one million, let's, let's think so. We've got four byte integers, so our array is uh, an interarray, right? We have four byte integers and our cache blocks were 64 bytes wide, which means that if we access array bracket zero, then we're gonna pull in also, in addition to array bracket zero, we're gonna pull in array bracket one, two, three, and so on, up to 15. So that means that the next 15 array accesses are going to hit. But then when we go to array bracket 16, we're gonna miss again. And so if we consider that we have a total of a million elements and we divide that million by 16, what do you know? We get 62.5. And so all of our misses are accounted for. Every 16 elements through the array, we miss. Then we hit for another 15, then we miss again. Then we hit for another 15, we miss again. Questions about that? By the way, kind of a neat effect here. Um, you might be wondering why there's a one miss on this line with the close brace. This is kind of neat. What happens when our function is done executing? What is the last instruction it executes? It executes a return. How does return work? Well, it goes on the stack. And it's gonna look for an address on the stack for where to return to. When sum forward is done, we're gonna return back to main, right? 
So it's going to go on the stack and it's going to try to read that address. Is the, st the stack is in memory, so if the stack is in memory, we need to do a data route. We need to do a data read. And so, is that data read going to be in the cache? Well, in this case, the answer is no, because I filled the entire cache with this array already. And so I may have you know, kicked it out or something. And so now, no more room. Um, so then we actually miss on the return statement. And it's kind of cool that we can even see that. So far so good? So now we can look at some array backwards. We can see that the profile looks absolutely identical. And sure enough, we can say, hey, it's, you know, we saw that the two numbers match, right? The sum forward, sum backwards, uh, they're basically just about the same. There's maybe a little bit of variance from just timing, but we can expect them to be just about, just about the same. So now we can go to this unrolled version where, recall, we had, uh, you know, half as many instructions, basically. We had 2.2 uh, million fewer instructions, but we still have 62,000 cache misses because we still need to access a million element array. If we didn't have 62,000 cache misses, then we would probably see some pretty good benefit from the unrolling here. But because we do have those misses, well, bummer, we, you know, it's just going to be, um, we're not going to get um, as much of a benefit as we'd like. It looks like, in this case, the, the accesses for the array are kind of dominating our runtime. Does that make sense? So the question is, are, those, are these misses inevitable? In this case, so the answer is pretty much yes, right? If you have a million element array and you really do need to walk through the array of a million elements, yes. There's nothing you can do because they weren't in the cache before, right? Um, and so, that, so there are a few different kinds of misses. This is called a cold miss. A cold miss basically means this is the first time we access the memory. And if it's the first time we access the memory, well, you don't have a choice. Of course it's not in the cache because it's the first time we accessed it. Let me show you some cache misses that aren't inevitable, though. Down here, I've got the sum odds and then sum evens. Again, the total number of instructions is the same, still 5 million. The total number of data reads is the same. It's a total of a million between the two of these. But each of these lines has 62,000 cache misses. Because in this case, if I access array bracket 0, I'm going to hit when I look at 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and 14. But, I mean, I also pulled in 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, but I didn't use them. So every 8 accesses now is going to be a miss. This miss is not inevitable. Or I should say these, really, right? Like the first, first 62,000, you can be like, yeah, that's kind of inevitable. These are not. These second 62,000 misses were because we summed the array in a kind of silly order. And if only we had actually taken more advantage of spatial locality, our program would run faster. So, um, So here we can calculate the miss rate for, um, for, for these uh, accesses. The miss rate on this line is now 1 out of 8. So if you actually look at the total kind of miss rate for this block of instructions, if we just wanted to calculate it, um, it's going to be a million accesses, but 130,000 or 100, yeah, 125,000 uh, misses. So we would say that the miss rate is actually uh, 1 in 8. And then up there, the miss rate is 1 in, 1 in 16. That all make sense? No questions? And I, I guess I already kind of showed you the random one a little bit, but this is pretty substantial, right? All right, so we've got 3 million extra instructions, or we got an extra million instructions for a total of 6 million. But that's not our problem. Our problem is that in 2 million accesses, so we did increase the number of accesses by, two million, by a million because we also need to access indexes of i. But here's the thing, right? We access indexes of i in order from 0 to n. How many misses is that? Well, it's 62,500, right? Because there are a million indexes. 
So we missed 62,500 times. But we have a total out of the 2 million accesses, we have a total of about 1.05 million misses. 62,000 of those were from the indexes array, which means that 993,000 of these misses were from the 1 million attempts to access array bracket i. So our miss rate on accessing array, on accessing a bracket i, or a bracket indexes of i, our miss rate on accessing a is 99.3%, which is terrible, right? That's, that's not going to do. And that is how we can explain the 6x runtime increase. Not from the instructions, not from the number of data reads, from this. Questions about that? Let me show you another example. I'm actually going to make clean and get rid of the, the call grind reports so I don't have to deal with them. I'm going to run local this other program uh, called locality. And what this program is going to do, um, it's going to be pretty similar, but what I'm going to do is it's going to sum up an array. It's going to go in order. It's going to go uh, forward. It's going to sum an array. Of, in this case, it's, so this number is, is an order of magnitude smaller. It's 100,000 elements. We're going to sum it up, and we're going to ask how long that takes overall. In this case, it takes 222,000 cycles. Um, and then we calculate that that's roughly uh, two cycles per element. Right, maybe I'll show you the code real quick. Uh, let me actually do it in the other window. So here, you know, we're going to do the normal thing. We're going to sum up an array. Right? But then we're also going to try, for the same size of a collection, we're going to try summing up a linked list of 100,000 uh, Elements. So your usual linked list, while C not equal, while it's not null, we're just going to keep going. Right. And, um, you know, so and now we want to ask the question so how much worth do we do by summing up a linked list versus summing up an array? Or, you know, um, so an array is probably the most cache-friendly data structure we can, we can have here, right? So our goal is to try to understand, like, how do we write code that's really going to play well with the cache? We call that cache-friendly. And so an array is probably the most cache-friendly thing you're ever going to have. Everything is laid out right next to each other in con contiguously in memory. A linked list, not so much. We're jumping around, you know, uh, the next pointer could point to some other place in memory, which could point back, which could point over here, then point back. So in the end, um, we figure that the linked list version is going to is going to is going to be much less cache friendly. Let's see how much less cache friendly. So I'm going to run minus l here to run the linked list version. Oops. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so uh, it looks like there there is going to be a lot of variance um, when we play with the caches. One of the big problems with caching is that uh, the cache is actually being shared by every user on the machine. So when I said that these cycles were actually independent of other users, they're not totally. Um, so if somebody else happens to be running a program at exactly the same time that I am, then the number is going to spike. Um, but this is actually pretty close to what the average is when the machine is quiet. So, um, so here you can see there's a difference of about uh, 2x. Right? Yeah, so you can see there's a difference of about 2x, right? Or 10x, sorry. Um, so here, you know, it's, it's 2,800k, 2, whereas up here it's 200k. But basically per element, this is a, we're looking at like 29, so like 10 to 15x uh, slower to sum a linked list than to sum an array. And so as before, we want to understand why. So let's use call grind. I'll do the simulate cache equals yes thing. And I'll run locality minus a. So I'll run the array one and the linked list one, and I'll put them both up um, next to each other. So first, let me show it to you um, without the caching. 
All right, so we've got 30430. So I'm going to guess that the net last one was 30465. Um, so I'm going to page down. So here I'm just going to show it to you. So this is just, this is without the cache information. Let me pull up on the other side here. I'm going to dot slash annotate 30, was it four? Or page down. So you can see um, that if I switch between the two here, so this one is a total of 400,000 instructions. So this is, so 100,000 elements in my uh, array or my linked list. So, so 400,000 um, total instructions for the linked list version. If I switch over here, they line up perfectly. Awesome. Uh, we've got 500,000 instructions for my array version. That's not explaining it. This actually would almost make me think that the array version was somehow slower. But it's definitely not. So let's run it with cache information. So I had already done the simulate cache, but the way my script was set up, if I didn't add the minus C, it wasn't going to uh, give me, show me the cache information. And I'll run this one. So now here we can see for the array one, uh, oops, that's the linked list one. Here's the array one. So for the array one, okay, uh, 6,250 cache misses. That is exactly what we expect from last time when we did the uh, sum array forward, right? We have, we have 10x fewer elements, so we have 10x fewer misses. We're still missing one every 16 uh, elements. Over here on the linked list case, first of all, Notice we have an extra 100,000 data reads from reading cur equals cur arrow next, so reading the next field, right? But that wasn't our problem. We didn't miss there. Where we missed is right here. And we missed 99.1% of the time. It's pretty significant, right? And that's going to, again, explain to us or show us that linked list code fundamentally is just going to be slower um, than array code, especially if you know, our heap is kind of a mess and, and our linked list cells get allocated all over the place. So maybe this kind of starts to lead us into this question of, so what do we do, right? Is the answer just don't use linked lists ever? I mean, that's not a very good answer. It's not a very satisfying answer. There are certain situations where maybe we could use an array, in which case that's probably better. Um, but Linked lists are a really useful data structure. We, we want them. We like them. We there's a reason we learned about them. They solve a really useful problem. But um, this starts to give us the impression that we can't think of linked list accesses as being as expensive as going to the next element of an array. Another thing that we might notice from this code, this may become fairly relevant for heap allocator, for example, is that up here, we have the access to cur arrow next, and that is not missing in the cache. Why is that not missing in the cache? Well, it's not missing because over here, we already accessed cur arrow data. So if we missed to pull cur arrow data into the cache, then the next pointer is going to be right next to it in memory. It's going to be adjacent in memory so that these 100,000 data accesses do not miss. On the other hand, if we had something that was maybe a little more complicated, where let's say inside of this body we had another for loop, we could end up with the very unfortunate situation where this line started missing. And if that happens, those misses we might figure are avoidable. Um, so imagine if we, we ran our program and we looked at this line and we saw 99,000 misses on this line as well for cur equals cur arrow next, then we might suspect, huh, maybe I should take the next variable, maybe I should take the next value and put it into a local variable right at the beginning here so that I don't, I don't see those misses. So this does inform our discussion a little bit. Let me show you another quick example, like one final example of, I think, kind of how we can assess or like kind of what the, what the real implications of locality are. So here I'm going to run the linked list version, but I'm going to run it on 200,000 elements. 
And we'll actually notice that it's a lot. So here, let me do the, the one with 100,000 again. Oops. All right, so the one with 100,000, this machine is too busy. Well, it's going it's, to, so it's, at the lowest case, it's between like 20 and 30, right? And sometimes it's going to be about 40, but sometimes the machine's really busy. Um, but you'll notice that 200,000, it's not 2x. Um, like, you would think, oh, well, maybe the number of cycles is going to be 2x. But once I divide by 200,000 elements, you'd expect, you wouldn't expect a 10x jump here, right? Well, we can actually analyze that a little bit. Um, yeah, I want to do it. Let's do that. So let's do val grind tool equals call grind uh, sim. Oh, it doesn't like, I don't like doing that. Hang on. Sorry, I'm going to type the whole thing correctly because the tab completion is really unhappy. So we're going to do locality minus L 200,000. And so here, so I think over here I was doing the linked list one. Is that right? So, yep, fantastic. And over here, we're going to do annotate minus C of call grind 2009. So at this point, we're still not seeing the problem, right? So yeah, okay, the number of, uh, the number of data refs doubled. The number of cache misses doubled, but that's still not explaining the 10x slowdown. Whenever we see 10x slowdown, though, we should think, huh, order of magnitude? That kind of sounds like we went to another level of the cache. That kind of sounds like a miss penalty. Hmm, interesting. I'm going to change the way I run this thing a little bit. I have another flag on my annotate script, which is that I'm actually going to show another column. Let me switch to capital C. Let me, let me do that on both of these. So what I'm actually showing, in addition to the one before, I'm showing another column called DLMR. Remember that, uh, so L, we're going to think of that as being 2, always, in this case. So DLMR is the number of times we miss the L2 cache. The L2 cache on our machine, notice, is 6 megabytes. So here, in the 100,000 case, we never missed. That dash means we never missed the L2 cache. Over here, we missed it 18,000 times. And that is where we're going to start seeing our order of magnitude slow down. So you can actually kind of do the math for why exactly this happened. Um, I'll tell you that there's a little bit of extra. I can tell you that basically every time we malloc a cell, we're actually setting aside 32 bytes. So if you, do the, if you work it out, 32 times uh, 200K, we're actually looking at just over 6 megs. And then when we're in contention with other stuff, um, you know, now we're out of, out of space. So there you have it, right? This is, this is what the cache does for us. So let me summarize um, to help you kind of big picture ideas here. What do we need to do to write cache-friendly uh, cache code, right? So we can't just say, don't use linked lists, but I mean, we want to be smart about our data structure choices. If we are using a linked list, uh, I already showed you kind of issues like, well, we should probably group accesses to the same cell together if we can. Access the data field, access the next field, access the next field and the previous field together, right? Like maybe it will help us. Also, um, consider temporal locality. Think about like if a piece of, if a cell was just very recently used, then putting it at the beginning of my linked list so that I'll use it right away might be much better than putting it at the very end of my linked list um, where I'll have to traverse the whole, th whole list to find it, not to mention it's way easier in code. And then just conceptually, we need to make sure we don't think about accesses to linked lists. We need to not think about memory accesses as all being the same, right? An access of cell arrow next is going to be a very different characteristic um, of memory access than array of i plus 1. And the final point that I want to make as we get into heap allocator and as you start working on that, 
make measurements. We have all these really cool tools, Valgrind, CallGrind, all these, uh, you know, CallGrind with and without cache simulation to help us to understand our programs, to understand miss rates, to understand whether caches are a problem. And we want to answer, we want to be able to answer these questions empirically. We do not want to just take a guess. If we look at our code and say like, hmm, I think caches are going to be the problem. Um, without having any data to back that up, I assure you, you're going to be going in circles trying to figure out how you're going to make your pro program more cache friendly when maybe that just wasn't your problem. Maybe your problem was you just actually had an extra billion instructions that you didn't expect. Right? So make use of these tools. We'll get lots of experience working with these tools in lab, and you'll hopefully see a lot of, have a lot of practice working with them on Heap Allocator. Um, hopefully you enjoy this lab. I think it is going to be pretty relevant for the final assignment. And we'll see you on Friday.